My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, I have a story to tell you, man. It's about a little little kid named Eddie who wanted to grow up and become a cartoonist, dude. And uh, this being a visual medium, I have some visual aids, dude. Uh, there was old McFarlane interviews where he espoused his wisdom of a thousand crappy pages, get them out of your system, blah, blah, blah. I didn't bring a thousand crappy pages, but I brought a hundred maybe. That's, that's quite a stack of artwork you have there, Ed. <laughs> it follows probably fourth grade up to Harvey Pekor. And we'll just blast through some of this stuff, man. Wow. And I'll talk about some of the influences at the time and shit. Sounds great. So I had no idea that, ex that sketchbooks existed. So I just used like uh, three ring notebooks, man. Just the standard stuff you could get at the grocery store. And this, this isn't my first comics, but it's the earliest ones that I still have called War. Just kind of like uh, how Atari would have games called Baseball or Boxing. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. It's so funny because that guy doesn't look like a soldier. I know, right? <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be a backward hat because yes, he's cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you see many, many uh, panels per page. Uh, the one colonel, like the authority figure, that's kind of like Mr. Buzzcut from uh, Beavis and Butthead because that's the era, you know? Um, I cribbed this story like this part of the story where he's like pop the smoke and all this, this is from i think nom number six because that was like one of my favorite comics that i probably discovered right around that time man that's amazing uh there's a lot of uh i never saw <laughs> i never saw um an asian person in my in my in real life when i was uh making this comic and all the villains have like the three like the triangle hats and <laughs> and shit like that so you know please don't try to ruin my career for this like i know that like people like to dig into people's past to you're exposing yourself here, destroy Ed. them and stuff uh you know don't hold fourth grade eddie p a couple of shots of a tank here pretty impressive because we see the tank rolling sideways and then an overhead shot that's pretty sophisticated stuff for a young <laughs> cartoonist yeah they're uh breaking people out of the hanoi hilton <laughs> <laughs> it's also impressive to see the uh the panels like you know so many cartoonists or aspiring cartoonists like we're all in it just to draw the cool pinups and covers right for a long time so to have panels uh at an early age that's pretty far ahead of the game i was doing like these sunday sunday one pagers man of uh power rangers wow when i was and that's my little brother it's like me and my little brother and we're the power rangers so, you know, there's the team. And I think what happened here is mom saw that I was, like, enjoying drawing. And she let me, like, get her color pencils, man. They were, like, these technical color pencils that, that had, um, like, they were lead holders. Wow. So the leads, there, it was, there was such a finite amount of them. And they looked old. Like, I don't think, I still, I don't think I've ever seen them ever again. So I was very spare with my color because I didn't want to use them up. But there's a Rita. And I didn't know her name was Rita and called her Rena. <laughs> but there it is, man. That's the money shot when they first, like, you know, change into sure. their characters, man. I like all of it. I like that to be continued big letters. Look at that. The Green Ranger. <laughs> we follow along now. Now, the way it worked, man. You, was... you do need color for these. So it, it makes sense. <laughs> Your mom saw that. Good on her. There was no, uh, there was no internet and there wasn't, there was no merchandise yet. And I say all of that. Because I had to try to remember what the Megazord looked like when it was time to draw the Megazord. <laughs> and uh, so when you see it, <laughs> it's kind of... It's pretty good. It kind of doesn't kinda... work. And that's my idea of a tr Tyrannosaurus right there. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. 1993... Uh, 11 years old. Those would be some splash panels if you were to do it now. You know, the big T-Rex showing up. Right. Yeah, exactly, man. <laughs> This is where stuff gets gets more serious, man, because uh, it's ninety. It's ninety three. I'm in I'm in uh, sixth grade, and I got some prank color pencils for Christmas one year or something, and uh, that's Mr. Mitchell from uh, Dennis the Menace, and then there's Mr. Buzzcut again. You know what I'm saying? Like a big big mark for uh, Beavis and Butthead returning character. When I was a, in fact, that's that's almost like Stuart. Man, it's this is such a level uh, of greater intensity with the coloring and attention to that. These these took some time. Yeah, man. Like it was, 
had nothing but time, dude. Like, I lived in a fucking war zone when I was a little dude, man. And there was all sorts of bad shit happening all around me. Ain't, ain't playing outside that much. People catching bullets next door. I'm just going to stay inside and draw. Uh, this character is sort of inspired by... I had this old Mike Grell Green Lantern issue. And there was a set of panels where uh, the character breaks... It's actually in the... There would be backups in that in uh, Green Lantern where it would be a story with old Green Lantern, like the multicolor guy. And there was like a story where he breaks out of the ground and, and it's sort of like this thing. So I just totally like stole that bit. But around this time is when the X-Men cartoon started up. And uh, I decided to uh, to sort of change my, my whole... Uh, trajectory man like i'm not going to be fucking around with these with these creator owned uh characters anymore man i need to incorporate some mutants <laughs> in, in, into into the series and i lose interest in that quite quickly what you're going to see in this pile a lot of loss of interest man a lot of three page things and then i get tired and then i have to draw you know that's pretty that's pretty strong my own uh x-men comics and my and my innovation is like well, why not just cut your legs off and get mechanical ones? Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense within the X-Men universe. That was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's there's stuff that he says in here, that the characters say in here, that is like literally like lifted from the TV show. Because it was like... So, and the, my idea is these are the ki- the, the children of the, the proper X-Men, man. So it's like Nightcrawler's son named Willy. <laughs> Willy Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> Flash page. I only had that uh that you know the X Factor costumes with their X's all over the place. Yeah. And I'm just like, they don't have enough X's, man. Like, I was gonna say it's more. almost like triple X Men. <laughs> and it was that one uh John Byrne issue, man, where I think it was like Kitty's trial and you see you see the back view of Professor X like in the danger room, uh hitting buttons and shit. And at and at school we had those like tear sheet things where you could order books. And, and it was a color X Men coloring book, and it was John Byrne, like eight pages from John. And they send you like those, those markers that dry up real fast. So I had reference. <laughs> so the difference between a swipe, in, in other words, <laughs> right? Like this is dated January '93, uh, but I knew comics, so that means I drew this either in November or December. Ah, right, right. And I say that because color pencil. Eddie P got some markers, man, for for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and was able to continue the story. This stuff is published in uh, the X Men Grand Design uh, comics. You know, like pages from this thing, and it's very much inspired by the Genesis game. This is really neat. I love how the attention to the parallel of the colored lines. It's it's very organized. Um, I didn't always do that whenever I was coloring things. Sometimes I'd be coloring in all kinds of directions and it would look like shit. But it, it adds like that outsider kind of style, like a quality of obsession that you can see there. But also with materials that you know aren't quite the right materials. Right. Like it, it's that's all neat, man. There was like it was like a prang art set and there were like 11 markers. This is like the closest to Caucasian skin color, you know, so it's like you, you use what you can. But every brushstroke you see here is a death of a thousand paper cuts because I wanted that flat color, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and so it, so I didn't get it. So I'm literally hating myself with each stroke. It's pretty cool to see like the flat, the different background colors that you go with. Like that's pretty bold. A lot of people do the, uh, like an all natural approach early on. So the idea of comic books will do this where they have different colors that aren't at all related to the nature of what's happening. But it makes the page look better. Yeah, and I th- I bet you the motivation for this was like, well, that's going to take a lot of color. Let me just waste a pink. Yeah. Get this out of my life because I don't want to waste a good color. And then that's this is like Eddie like learns that you put two lines together and can almost make a gray. That's like the first time. So it's like, let me just abuse that yeah. everywhere from that's now on. That's pretty neat. This is amazing. Like, whatever <laughs> that background is, really good. And then 12 pages of that. Pretty cool. Fast forward, like, what, like, like, this is January of 94, May of 95. This is a kind of Extreme Studios submission pack, man, because that's, that's Cougar, and that's, that's Link from Extreme Sacrifice when he comes back and has the blue, and you see it's like, his claws pop out, 
and then it's like the splash when he confronts the guy. And you could see I was definitely a... St- I discovered Stephen Platt this year. <laughs> a lot of leg muscles there. Yeah. And that's supposed to be double lighting and shit. I was going to say a lot of double lit leg <laughs> muscles. And then... Hey, oh, s- this is page one. S- smart move, by the way, putting the dates on this stuff. Anybody watching at home that's making comics, like, date your artwork. Because it, it's... Uh, I know I never remember when this stuff is from. Yeah. So put your date on the back of your artwork or somewhere on there for future reference. So my folks like saw I was kind of serious about the shit. They enrolled me in these classes uh, where that were seasonal, and it's like you know winter, spring, summer, fall, and that was cool. I, I would do those every time they would come come down the pike, man. And the teachers saw that there was like a need for maybe another level, and they created like a comics production class, man. And that's where we get into like the first published Eddie P comics, dude. Wow, here we go. Which which was huge to me. And, you know, what a cover! Here's here's the original, and and it's like I was a fucking dickhead from day one, so it's me cutting promos on all the other kids. It's like <laughs> they're like uh, like standing on their faces and and throwing dynamites at them and shit like that, uh, because it was like there were like sort of the younger kids who were who were there to just uh, be baby babysat, and then there were like two or three people who were like more serious about comics, and like of course they get to they get the cool treatment. And the little, like, wuss kids, you know, they get that. But the way it worked was every kid got 10 copies of their thing. So it's like, the idea was, like, create a schedule, a manageable schedule, and uh, and hit those marks. And then everybody gets 10 copies. So there were, like, 15 kids in the class or, you know, however many kids. And so this amount of people times 10. That's how many copies of this exist, man. 60 or 70 copies. Uh, so this is, you know, 96... 13, 14 years old, wow. uh, I discovered uh, Kamui, my first manga. And uh, uh, check this right here. I uh, <laughs> I swipe this pose Wow. F- for uh, this guy's pose right here because I couldn't like figure out how to draw a dude dynamically like coming at you. And I felt guilty about that. I'm like, I feel like a fucking cheater. <laughs> You're but, coming clean now. Yeah, but it's just like, I just didn't know that that's like totally acceptable. Uh, so those pages are strong, man. I also discovered Cerebus this year. It was like Kamui, Cerebus. Like, like I was making more comic book discoveries. As soon as you say it, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, you see like enthusiasm to begin with, and then powder and out, <laughs> powder and the out. Cross hatching's just gone by the by the bottom of the page. There's no more time. Uh, and then a fucking white page, you know. So like you build up those patience muscles, Jim. Cool cover. Yeah, man, like a composition notebook because you, I discovered Harvey Kurtzman and I discovered Mad. Uh, they started to put out these reprints every quarter of uh, four issues or three issues of Mad and, with the orange spine. And, and I got those things around this time. I just freaking loved it. And so it's like had to make it like a composition notebook, you know, in fact, bound it the same way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Eddie P got to gotta lead off the, the story here, man. And uh, another four pager that I kind of powder out quick, <laughs> and and you see you see like, you know like the other kids are fucking pretty whack. You could tell this dude wanted to work for Image Comics or something too. But uh, you keep in touch with anybody from that? Fuck no. Um, you could see stuff like the life and death of Fritz the Cat, Mister Natural Three, <laughs> Zap Comics. So these these are like the influences, man. Sp- spasm, you know, <laughs> yeah, spark. yeah, yeah. Uh, Alfred E. Newman Snoids, fucking needles with like coke, coke on mirrors. Uh, that's supposed to be like weed and like a blunt. <laughs> There's a spoon and and the and the little candle, wow. man. So you could blaze up that hair on a little forty ouncer. And then that's like literally the exact graffiti that would be like outside the house, man. Like, look, because we lived in a crip neighborhood. And there would just be, like, when I discovered that Kurtzman stuff, and I was just like, well, he just uses, like, a big, bold line. Like, maybe he'd use the Sharpie. And that's me trying to do, like, the Kurtzman crazy covers, not understanding, like, the craft behind the shit. Look at this, man. Before we had Photoshop, I cut up my mom's, uh, I cut up my mom's Cosmopolitan magazines. And this would have been like an ad or something. And that's pretty ambitious, these these first couple of covers. You know, like you're really trying stuff. Check this one out, man. I did I forgot I didn't spell ricochet properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, this is when I discover... The cool thing about the teacher was that he would hit me to some comics cartoonists that, that I just didn't know about. And so I discovered um, The Spirit. And so, like, I did my own, like, version of The Spirit comics, man. Seven pagers. And you could see, like, there's, like, the Dolan. There's, you know, my Erzatz spirit guy. That would be, like, the Ebony little dude named Andre, and then just, like, this, like, little goofball character. But, uh, you know, I, I use the same f format. Like, it's, like, seven pages, but you could see it, like, powders out at the end. And m m the ambitious thing here was, like, this is January 1st, 1997, and I was gonna do... I was gonna do a strip every seven days, man. I was gonna just do a regular thing, but I did two two of, of them. Just, just one other one. This is, you know, some of the pages from that, the, of, of the shit that we just saw. Math rules. Yeah, right. I think I think I got, a, like, a C on my progress report and was, like, you know, ready to commit suicide. <laughs> but uh, here's the other The Law story that I did, man. And I think this was even... Nah. Um... This is like me starting to get better pens. Mom is hooking me up with better pens and shit, man. So I'm, you know, I probably got my first Rotring here. It started like trying to like fuck with lighting because that's like the things you learn from from looking at Eisner. But then also I'm looking at Frank Miller shit. That's a pretty interesting like I like this this character and this. I don't know foreshortening or whatever of the car. Like those both look pretty good. Yeah, that's that isn't supposed to be design oriented. That's like me doing my best at perspective. It but looks it's just good though. Like, it reminds me of stuff like cabby or something. Right. And then of course, man, we're powdering out. We're powdering out. Nine panel grid. Yeah, man. Pulls out the gat. Look at that. He has like a little skull in his eye when he shoots him. <laughs> Look at that gun. I had no reference for guns. <laughs> it's like a Glock. That, make that, that, that reads. <laughs> and then the idea is that a bum saw him do this murder. And then it's, and he has to kill the bum, but the bum is revealed to be our man, the law. And he gets scared, <laughs> runs away. And then uh, when they leave, the cops are there to, to apprehend them. The cop had, had a pretty good look too. Look at that cop's face. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, this is my first two page spread. Oh, damn. Using the Rob Liefeld texture, you know, that, that little square thing he would do in the back of uh, yeah. X-Force. Wow, man. How long? This must have taken a while. Yeah, I'm sure. Look at the rendering, like, on the arm and stuff. Yeah, yeah. that looks good on, in print. You know what's crazy? is cool all hands. Is all four of these comics are drawn in, this, in the same year. Like, so you saw that first, like, Kamui-looking thing and how rough it was? There are these, like, periods of exponential growth. And then, and then a plateau, and then exponential growth again, and then plateau over time, man. So I colored this after because I was, like... For I was bored, I guess, man. But I didn't make good because I hated. The, I was like, no, I just ruined my two-page spread. But this is like me trying to figure out perspective, like all of that nonsense, man. Starting to figure out that the middle of the figure isn't like the penis area, like, you know, like the the hips, like the upper body smaller. It's like slowly figuring that kind of shit out. It'd be funny to draw, like to do all those wrong sort of. Th things and make that your style right <laughs> where, where characters are exactly at half the waistline <laughs> <laughs> this is me redoing my my kamui wannabe man when when i developed a little bit more skills you know after you saw ronin uh yeah, maybe <laughs> there there is something here that is definitely from like right that's after pretty ronin. wild that looks that looks pretty pretty strong and it's it's definitely post gerhard like yeah. trying to capture all those cool wooden textures all right, man. G-Men. I think this is probably the, the most pages of, like, one thing that, that I have, but they're not all finished, mostly penciled. And the idea, like, I got that book, uh, Batman's, the greatest Batman stories ever told, where it has Golden Age yeah. up to, like, more current. And I love the Golden Age look. Like, I loved it so much, man. So this is, like, this is, like, the modern-day G-Men. And then uh, this is, like, would be a shadow that's being cast on them. And then you see, their, like, their Golden Age personas so like there's a golden age story here and then there's like the modern day story all inspired by like frank miller in a way uh well that's not true because like this 
Look at that reading Under the Hood by Hollis Mason. <laughs> um, the only thing, the only drawing I ever drew that where my pops was like, hey, that's a good drawing. Like, that, that's, that's in here somewhere. Let me try to find Oh, yeah, it's this. Like, that's the only time my pops was like, hey, boy, I really like the way that turned out. And I think he responded and thought that, that this was like double lighting, yeah. but it was really me just creating a halo because I wanted silhouettes on this dude and was like, oh, no, the black is going to match, so I have to, like, separate it some. But he was like, god damn, boy, you're getting better. <laughs> So this this one is inspired by like probably the first story, not greatest Batman stories, where it's like the werewolves and and Batman Batman shoots and kills them with like silver bullets. This is like they're uh, they're doing forensic analysis on some fur that they found, and then right when he discovers like the cause, like where that fur comes from, it's too late, man. There's a werewolf behind them, and then they get caught. They got they get put in some sort of cell, and you could tell them powdering out. And in the Batman comic, there were, there were like these tunic wearing foreign bad guys, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, they get out, they get out of that somehow. I think they have like a skeleton. Oh yeah. They have a skeleton key and then they melt down their skeleton key and then, st and then stab the dudes in their chests to, to like kill them. And then Jeez. check this out. Man. After Don Simpson, because in Bizarre Heroes, there was like a two-page sequence where it was like that that jungle girl changing clothes and like changing into her jungle persona. So that's what this is supposed to be here. This is like him changing into his like superhero persona. <laughs> and then this one, clearly... I mean, look, it's written and drawn by Frank Spiller. <laughs> <laughs> clearly... Uh, enamored with the lack of holding lines and stuff from, from Sin City. So this is like the modern day I feel like everybody from this period was doing this. Yeah. I know I have my uh, sketchbooks with this kind of uh, Sin City explorations. Yeah, man. The the little furrowed brows and the, stuff. The brick wall shadow is well done. Like That's 100% spot on. And this is the 7th uh, grade skater haircut that probably 70 to 80% of boys at Still Valley High School uh, we're sporting that haircut. Um, so then, you know, super verbose. Like, here's what Sin City was to me. Super verbose. Uh, weird character design. So, like, I, I knew Ronin, too. And he would draw... Like, one of the striking side characters in Ronin was... It was, like, a black lady who had a swastika. And I was like, well, why would a black lady have a swastika? So I had this this black dude with, like, a weird swastika on his like I drew it wrong there but drew it more right there but he's teamed up with like this like hippie guy and they're both bad dudes I didn't know that hippies were like peace and love you know that hippie dude that drawing of it reminded me of Sam Keith and or Matt Wagner you're very kind look at the, how aged and weird this is man yeah some of the papers man because they would have these pre-printed papers I would get some of those too toilet paper it must be terrible yeah toilet paper uh so you can see like trying to play with black and you know like purely black face like that's like a mirror a miller stroke and then uh I'm, the stray bullets phase of your life exactly <laughs> these are look amazing. at this after lap them nice and then but check this out and i'm going to just cover this because 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 this information is still my parents address and phone number so i'll cover that up but it's so valley high grade nine age 14 I was a Stray Bullets fan, boy. Can't fake the funk, man. And you can see this is a separate piece of paper because once uh, again, uh, I printed up the logo on my mom's fax machine. Like I drew it on paper and then I made in infinite copies essentially on uh, my mom's fax machine because I was just going to keep... This is going to be a series, Jim. You know, I was going to do it on a bi-monthly basis, just like Stray Bullets. So you got to keep the logo consistent and the number, but the number changes. <laughs> and then I guess I got my first white outs or bought some pro whites so I'm like and, oh and also it's inspired by the Gladstone reprints of Dick Tracy comics that would be mostly six uh, six panel pages but the introductory uh, page the splash page would have one blown up panel so it's it's Lester Lester Cold is the is the name And then it gets into the body, but like, look at that right there, man! Wow, little head wound, little exit <laughs> wound, a lot of exit wound. <laughs> yeah, man. 
97, that's like, you know, 14 or so. Uh, and this would have been for that Criminal Minded comic. It was like a Mike Tyson kind of guy. Shaft headgear on your boxer. Yeah. When I saw the uh, Crumb wow. documentary, like this, this is probably like ninth or, t or tenth grade. I was like, okay, so you're supposed to do anthropomorphic animals in notebooks. Like I'll do some of that. And uh, this is sort of what I came up with. And this is the era, man. We're in boss gear and uh, triple fat goose bubble coats. You remember them shits? They're kind of back, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and the idea is they 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 kill this worm. And then uh, they're they're sort of yeah they kill this the, the crow kills this worm, and then the, and now the the crew is on the run, so they're in the cell they're in the sewer and they're in, they found a tub down there and they're they're going to just like float float down the sewer I don't know. Um, sort of make a comics with friends like I was like I'm, I should be a collaborator and and uh, had some home homies uh, write scripts for me. My homeboy HB, I know I knew him since I was 15, so I was probably 15 when I did this. Pretty accurate portrayal of my first comics experiences, man, where it's like the uh, the um, titty model, like the penthouse lady, big line, and then we're just sitting there fucking pounding our puds, trying to give people the hard sell. And then when uh, when they don't, when they're not buying what we're selling, then we're, you know, throwing them or something. And I'm like, yo, dude, why do you throw him? <laughs> More hard sell stuff. Me trying to be the the diplomat to sell these like little shorties, but then they notice that I don't know John Byrne is, is there, or and they see him and then they leave, and then that's me like, fuck you guys, <laughs> and my homeboy laughing at me. Uh, these are uh, very universal. I feel like anybody that's done shows has some version of this as their first uh, first experiences. And this is before my first convention, but I think I saw some pretty sad puppy dog faces at the Pittsburgh Comic Con. Oh man. yeah. Uh, just some more shit, some more shit, uh, and then eventually, like, 98, getting more and more serious, and my pops reveals to me that he wrote, like, dozens of film scripts in, like, the 80s, you know, he was, like, it was, like, a Ralph Crandon kind of thing, man, he was out of work at the, uh, at the, at the steel mill and decided, I'm going to become a, a, a movie writer, and I still have all these scripts, and I fucking love them. I adore them. The id on display is incredible. Uh, and the one that felt most insidious, we'll say, was uh, one that he did on like that Richard Kuklinski, like the Iceman Killer. But it was called the Iceman, but it had nothing to do with it. It was just like a serial killer who like killed prostitutes. So as you can see, this is the cover. Uh, the thing that I like a lot <laughs> is, is uh, June 4, 1998. I bet you the last day of school was June 3rd because that's how I would like manufacture my, my summers. I would get like a package of this paper and my summer vacation would be spent like making comics, you know? So like the day after school lets out, I, st I got to start making, some and look, that's like Miho. That's like a Miho wannabe. But, uh, and I think Stone Cold Steve Austin was, was, uh, <laughs> was in vogue, man. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. This is outlaw shit, man. It, it really early is, age. man. It really is. Using a shitty watercolor brush to do the inking. You know, got to get a hold of that shitty watercolor brush. One of the things that fucked me up so much was, like, the perspective. Because my table was a finite amount of space. So, like, how do you get, like, pleasing perspectives? You know, like, I, I didn't crack that. Yeah, your of, vanishing like, points are too far. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the dumb stuff that every <laughs> cartoonist struggle with. Really trying to do the lettering, you know. Still still I had the Ames lettering guide, but I had it set weird. Look at this, man. <laughs> Looking at like a voyeur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rear window and stuff. That's pretty great. Yeah, I like that. Look at Miho showing off some dude. <laughs> flashing him. Gotta go to work. And then uh, my pops also did this, uh, he did this, like, uh, Western, but it was, like, old school Western, and I was like, that's boring, let me, like, 2000 AD it up, make him, like, uh, futuristic or something, man, so I called him Scare Malone, but, like, I forget what my pops, it was probably, like, Lash LaRue or, like, some real property, because that's what my dad would do, would just make, like, sequels or something, man. 
Uh, using, he, he's he's right, not a right. fan. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so uh, this is like you know the Artie Symec lettering because I because I discovered Kirby and like all those comics. Yeah. I, I like love that treatment of lettering in, in like mainstream comics. Uh, discover Eleven Rockets in the '90s, man. So I'm like trying to do like a clean line, like Jaime wannabe kind yeah, of thing. That's an interesting, interesting drawing there. Um, cool seeing all the lettering come through too, man. Like all of your title lettering has been interesting to watch that evolve. That it, looks very graffiti, obviously. It's a hip hop comic, mm -hmm. you know. Like it's like my first, you know, ten years, you know, fifteen years before uh, Hip Hop Family Tree. Um, it's neat how like these pages, some stuff will look really strong, right? Um, which, which I think is how it works. You know, like you, you, you sort of bring things up in different levels at different timelines. Uh, but like, you'll see pieces like, like that's really striking. It looks good graphically and everything makes sense. I'm trying to draw these, uh, Western things as like, uh, Sunday strip kind of thing, like adventure strip. You also, the thing I know a while back, you mentioned like, oh, you figured out lines and cross hatching. You could create grays. Very effective here, you know, both in clothing and in backgrounds. Like some of this stuff just gets folded in, but we saw it five years before this. You you start applying that. Yeah, it's like when you discover because uh, like after like the first iteration, it's like I discover Stephen Platt first, and you love that, and then I and then you see like I'm I saw rubber crumb, so it's like let me see those crumb textures and like put put those in there. Um, I remember showing this. This set of pages, I would I would basically make these pages and take them to the Pittsburgh Comic Con and just uh, with tracing paper over top and just have like Steve Lieber rip it to shreds and he was so gr gracious and nice. But I I also definitely remember showing uh, Mike Allred this page, man, and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you keep at it, kid, like type shit. Um, but like this, one of the things I remember is Steve Lieber giving me my first like a lesson in tangents. And so I would have the tracing paper over top and he would draw like, you know, you, you elevate this gun here so that you separate both of them, don't have them overlap. And that was like my first like great school of cartooning was That's just like every cool. year, like going to Steve Lieber and spend he, I'm sure he doesn't remember it, uh, but it was very, very meaningful and uh, important to me. Kayfabe sting. Yeah. <laughs> This is getting ready. This is like Kubert School submission time, and I'm taking a look at their at their uh, guidelines for what they want. And they want sequential pages, pencils. They want some inks. They want color. So like, let me let me get to work, man. Uh, yeah, who knows if it's like shows up well. If it's like the cathode ray fucking Stephen Platt pencils of your or whatever. Speaking of artists, like boy, do I see vigil in this. Yeah, yeah. I, Faust is definitely a part of it, but it was like. I I hid those comics in a million different places, man, because I just feared my mom ever fucking seeing those things and thinking less of me. But uh these four pages and and once again, let me let me give a shout out That's to That's badass. That's a really cool Batman. <laughs> you know, like it's it's a little overdone, but in a way that's what makes it so good. It's just a menacing shape. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. I, I do want to shout my, my folks out because they never talked me out of this. And when I was going through these pages, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know that I would have supported young Eddie. I'm not talking about this stage, but even earlier. Like, I don't know. That could, that could be dicey, dicey territory. I like the street, too. It's a good texture. It, it feels like that 70s, um, like 42nd Street flavor of yeah. like broken down where your pavement and sidewalks are rounded from being busted up a little bit and run over and stuff. It's a good, uh, it's a good texture. Like that's what I struggle with when I draw like a city scene is like trying to age it and put some right. wear and tear on it. Yeah. Because you start with just parallel lines and these perspective lines where it's like, it starts perfect and you need to make it look like it's been lived in like a real world. And if it's like run down where it's like some crime ridden alley, it needs to really look like it's been lived in and, and and worked on. And it's, it's, it's crazy too, how you could try to like make a chaotic scene, but when you start adding like little grit to it, it starts to gain a, kind of uniformity if you're not careful yeah like it's really hard to draw chaos when you think of composition and stuff check this out man batman on his bat phone saying that's like, hilarious saying like yo man open up the uh open up the um 
the Batcave door, man. I'm coming. I'm coming I, home. I would. I would read Batman if it was more of this kind of like <laughs> more real world esque. <laughs> That's probably post Watchmen. You know, you were doing realistic superheroes like yeah. Batman cribbing his phone and you know, you know, <laughs> pinching it in his shoulder. Th- I mean, that's Adam West, man. That, that's like you know the Bat phone in it's there. It's such like... hilarious body language, though. Yeah, totally. Also, as a car phone, it's very funny. It's like plugged in, like there's a cord and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Cubert <laughs> uh, School wanted wanted uh, some color, and I had no idea of like what kind of color shit I was supposed to give them, man. So I just made comics and colored them with them stinky Prismacolor markers. That's really nice, the graffiti handling where there's no outline on the graffiti, but all the board texture comes through. Pretty yeah. strong. Yeah, shouts to Alf, man. He was he was all over the place in like 1999 around Pittsburgh. You would see you would see his tags everywhere. It's pretty cool to reference like a real piece. Yeah, I used to uh, at this time I, I had a um, I had a website where I was taking. I would go around Pittsburgh and take photos of uh, different Pittsburgh graffiti. Never really did it in a serious way, but always like appreciated that art. And there would be hidden places where people would just draw like uh, they would paint these amazing masterpieces that would get, get painted over in a week or two. So I would just like go out every week, get a couple rolls of film, snap a bunch of pics and 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 uh, I guess scan them. Uh, yeah, I guess I scanned them. Um, and post them up on uh, this on Angel Fire website. It might still be up. How long did you do that? That's like ninety nine. This piece is dated. So probably like ninety eight, ninety nine, and and super early two thousand. My my New Year's Day memories of the year two thousand was on top of this old building we had in, in Homestead and painting a big mural uh, on like the little roof room thing that would be on the top of like uh, a tenement. And it was uh, aliens and said something like, you know, this is the end of the world as we know it or something. Because, like, we spent our New Year's up there, me and, like, five or six friends, hoping that we would see, like, all the lights go out and and chaos. And we would just be up there and just watch the chaos. That was that was a crazy time. I the reason I asked is, like, I moved to Pittsburgh in 2000 and would get up on the weekends early in the mornings and just go to neighborhoods and take pictures. Mm. And a lot of it was for reference purposes, but also just, I don't know, getting another city or whatever. Day. I like some of the graffiti on that page too, like under the window. It's a pretty nice color. It's and it's a good eye. Like, you know, we talk about observation as a cartoonist, and often it's in relation to characters or body language or whatever. But it's also stuff like that. You know, like you would have you would have a painted piece under a window. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, I showed this off on an earlier kayfabe. Um, the script is by Jules Pfeiffer and he did roughs in uh in you fully printed in comics and sequential art so I made a comic book of I, I finished it was this part of your Qbert submission it was yeah they wanted 15 pieces uh so we're, we're getting quite near like 12 or something um I really dug like when I discovered uh when I discovered Kurtzman's Mad it was a big inspiration to me and this is Trick Daisy by Chester Old this time. And the idea is he, he pulled over uh, a bus full of nuns and had to give him cavity searches and he's sniffing his fingers. And, and, there's, that, and there's that kids, uh, the beginning of kids, when he's like, mmm, butterscotch. <laughs> Just so fucking immature. <laughs> but this was actually, I like all of this, I was going to send to uh, Fa- Fantagraphics as for, like this would be like my eight ball so this would be like the inside front cover me introducing you to the series and then this would have been like one of the strips inside where i'm like visiting like a jay leno type show look at all that pretty cool look at all that stipple yeah man i like i like the size of the page too that you get like the scrap piece on the side of practice the lettering Mm -hmm. and then uh right before going to cubert here's a little uh page from a spider-man submission i sent to uh to marvel because my thought was well maybe i don't need cubert school so I'll, I'll do one more submission to marvel and see if they uh recognize my genius or whatever man pretty sure i cribbed that from a gary frank hulk piece man i didn't come up with that on my own that's way too good and then uh and then there's oh yeah this is cubert school a little painting uh, but at the Cubert School, we did a bunch of shit, man. We did Archie pages. And then you just present the stuff with this tracing paper, man, so that the teacher can 
can uh, cut promos What's on. What's that note say? Cramped panel, simplified background. He also hated my body language. He said, Archie doesn't have body language. And I said, and, and this many years later, I'm like, okay, you never heard of Harry Lucy. Lettering assignments. Uh, this would have been a Phil Felix lettering assignment, man. That's pretty cool. So they give you a piece of art, and then you're lettering on top on your tra on your transparency. Yeah, a piece of vellum. Um, let's just go through. Damn. Had to do a horror page. That's pretty sharp looking. Yeah, it's like when you get the good inking brush, and it, it like then it makes sense. Like you know, kind of how Charles Burns did. Yeah, it. yeah, you can really see it on the, a few of these like feathered pieces. Yeah. I still do this, man. On Red Room, I do this. Like, draw it at the small size. Yeah. Except back then, uh, what, I'm, what I'm sure I did was I blew it up 120% and uh, light boxed it. I like working at uh, printed size for a lot of stuff like that. Especially, like, covers and things. Yeah. To really get a sense of what they're going to look like. Probably show until 2 or 3, man. I, I had a Good vid train. video called, uh, called I Was a Teenage Marvel Reject, <laughs> man. And I think most... I know at least three other kids. We had to do a five-page fight scene, and I know they chose Bullseye Daredevil as well, man. <laughs> yeah, many thanks to Frank Miller for inspiring a generation. Look at that. This is Duotone from uh, back in the day, man. And it was like it's like a lined, like a ha like a hand lined uh, Duotone, man. Very Al Williamson inspired. It's supposed to be like a paperback book cover because that was like a potential. They still made paperbacks in two thousand. So it was going to be for, like, uh, some murder mystery or some shit. Also, it's supposed to be an editorial illustration. That's when I was in my, like, hardcore Drew Friedman face. I have a... I, I should bring it out sometime for a show until I have this... It's a cartooning book, you know, like, How, how To. Uh-huh. And it's from an ink company from, like, in the 1950s, I believe. Maybe even, like, 49. And it has all those of, like, what you can do with, with, this, uh, with this book. Uh, or what you can do with cartooning, essentially. And it has, of course, editorials and spot illustrations and all this stuff, but it's a massive list of where you might sell your comics. We were talking about High Eisman. He just received a Milk Caniff uh, Award. This is one of the High Eisman assignments, man, where he's talking about, like, like lettering can tell the story. And, uh, like, let's take, let's, take the art, let's take the art out of it, man. Just give you a, a blank space. Now, what can you do? What can you do with the lettering, man? Still super young, you know, like, why does it say pencils by High Eisman? Uh, that's Was, a good did he question. Do layouts with the lettering? Or? I think maybe he did the panel border. Or that's funny. That's funny if that's what it is. Like like he gave everybody yeah, right. the the same thing. Uh, maybe he did this, but that's too ugly. Like like I feel like that he's better than this. Um, that's a good question. K Fabers, or should I say, <laughs> or should I say, Cubert School K Fabers? Because there are several. Uh, remind That's me. That's pretty great. Yeah, I think the assignment was three different body types. Do a splash page. This was for like the life drawing class. You 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 learn the muscles, all that. Man, like now draw a, a splash page with three different body types. I like the Spider Man leg a lot. I'm sure the teacher helped me on that. I'm sure I didn't get that. Another high Eisman. Uh, see, he he could he could draw like these like Tom and Jerry things, man. And then it's like up to you to. Do the lettering. This is from a Mark Miller uh, swamp thing. Wait, I have a question on yeah. this. Are you painting like behind? Are you lettering yeah. on the front and then painting white? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, because then the next step is cut it out and, and, you know, paste it up or whatever. This is a Mark Miller swamp thing issue before he was famous. And uh, the teacher was like, yo, that this issue's whack. Uh, make a better version three pages wow. make a better version um because there was like no depth or whatever so it's like did he give you the issue or did he give you like a script i don't i don't remember see i the script i don't remember i think i think when we all showed off our stuff they brought the uh they brought the comic in and we all compared it that's kind of neat yeah that'd be, that'd be an interesting comparison that's a hell of a page yeah, I really, like, had this idea of, like, doing, like, stipple comics and stuff, man. And there's some other stuff in there, but I can't be showing that shit off. Uh, the idea was repeating background and then do paste. Like, this is pasted up. You can feel it. Uh -huh. You know what's great? Again, you mentioned cross-hatching not eight years before this or right. something. But you see it on display here of, like, having now a lot of different values from a very dark, solid value to, you know, different different degrees of gray. 
Um, Got to churn out them shitty pages when you're starting. That's what this whole exercise is about, man. Uh, uh, this is a Spider-Man submission that I did probably two years before meeting you or something, man. And uh, it still really just looks like Spider-Man sitting on top of like a model kit or something. Yeah, it's funny. That's that's what that would be your tracing paper note is like elevate him so we get a little bit of the black between him and the building top. Right. Make it look like he's above it. Uh, so that's a bunch of the Hubert School stuff. And then we, we get to, I got to pay my, pay my money back, man, to for going to the Hubert School. Um, worked at a call center. Worked at a call center for years, for like two years. And eventually I was just like, I cannot see myself fucking living a life where I have a boss who's not as smart as me. And I'm surrounded by 99% of people who are stupider than me. I need to go up. I need to become a cartoonist. So I, uh, while at the call center, I uh, brought in the ruled out Ames lettering guide. Uh, this is illustration board, um, the complete pages. And I, I wanted it on illustration board because it was like real stiff and I didn't have much room to move at the, uh, at the call center. So then I uh, did the lettering while, while on the clock because my thing was like, I'm going to get paid and fucking make my comics and shit. Um, Every cartoonist has a good story of that. Yeah. So, some job that somehow they were able to do some comics on the clock. And it's always great. It's always like professional cartoonist. I'm being paid and I'm drawing comics. Yeah. I saw this po this face, this in pose. That's a, that's a, I think his name is a Chuck Biscuits. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, he's, he's, free. he's a dude from Black Flag. And I took this drawing from uh, Fuck You Heroes, Glenn Friedman. I love that thing. And it's a dude pooping off a roof. Um, but I drew this strip. Submitted it to all the anthologies. Some good stuff in this. Um, obviously was rejected. Um, and then I drew this one. Sent it to all the anthologies, was rejected. And these two strips that I just am showing you now are what I sent to Harvey Picar and got a, got a call, you know, uh, the next week. Or something. So it's this material that got me my first comic job, and uh, it was, uh, you know, yeah. The idea, like, this is a true story, man. When me and my homeboys, we, we were in like third grade, and uh, one of them got a hold of like a handful of condoms, <laughs> and we were all like, "Well, let's let's figure out how to wear them, man." <laughs> and we went to a baseball field for some reason, and. Uh, the first hurdle was like trying to figure out how to even make a boner happen. And then after we like solved that, then I was like, yo man, are you supposed to put your nutsack in the condom too? I think That's they, funny. I think they were magnums, man, but <laughs> we were still little boys. <laughs> But that's it, man. That's a journey, dude. From uh, a little dude who wanted to grow up, draw comics, putting in that work, man, putting in that sweat equity. And, uh, getting that first opportunity man that's quite a journey ed i want to put this video together man just for the people who say uh living the dream or you're so lucky uh suck my ball sack yeah that is that is a decade of work right there yeah amazing anyhow man i'm gonna call this video probably a thousand crappy pages uh but that's just for monetization reasons I call it a thousand shitty pages, Jim. <laughs> well, I don't know. They're, they're not all shitty for sure, man. It's been interesting watching that, uh, the progression through those pages and some of the high points along the way. Um, it, so much of developing as an artist is that. It's like, yeah. I, I figured out how to draw this face or this pose or this one character. And then you see the other deficiencies around it. And it's like, identify those deficiencies, target those. Would you have uh, those... Would you have like eureka moments that would excite you to the point where you couldn't sleep when it came to drawing? I, it would happen to me fairly often, like uh, certainly at, at the youngest period when I'm like at this stage. Um, one was uh, when I figured out like the sort of hair braid m arm muscle where it's like the top and the back of the arm. It's like, don't make those even. That's all I wanted to do. Like when I figured that out, it might've been like say seven o'clock at night or something <laughs> when I did my first one that like felt good. And that's all I wanted. I could not go to sleep that night, man. I was just fucking drawing arms all night. And 
there were versions of that, you know, like uh, the three quarter view was a big step of, of the face. What, when you have to identify that there is a three quarter view, because it's like as a little kid, you're doing front and side, front and side, and then you're like, oh, you could like tilt the head a little bit. I, I always remember it, it is like magic whenever you learn that stuff or whenever you see somebody doing it like in a demo or something, you know, you take these, these Saturday art classes or something yeah. and be like, this is how you draw the, the, you know, you start with the oval and you divide it in half and then you divide that half in a, in a half. And that's your axis for that three quarter view. Look at Eddie P hating on himself. <laughs> <laughs> you should have to write that in your notebook, like fill your notebook with that. I may have. <laughs> I think we should get out of here and go draw some less shitty pages, Jim. I think you're right. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. We'll let you know when those next vids are available. And it's important you do so because we're on that road to 20,000 subscribers. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video. And you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. Let's get out of here, Jimmy. Give them those margin orders too. Make more comics.